So here's the question. In the print and packaging supply chain, how do we deliver new ideas and innovative practices to continually improve your profit, your brand, and your quality? Welcome to the Gamut Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff Collins, Director of Print Technologies for ID Alliance. We are a nonprofit global think tank serving the graphic communications industry with 12 offices strategically located around the world to better support our membership. You can support the Gamut Podcast and content like this by becoming a member at ID Alliance by going to www.idalliance.org. Today's episode is sponsored by Kodak. Kodak is a global technology company focused on print and advanced materials and chemicals. They provide industry-leading hardware, software, consumables, and services primarily to customers in commercial print, packaging, publishing, manufacturing, and entertainment. Welcome, everyone, back to the Gamut Podcast. This is part two of a two-part discussion with Ray Tidler, and Ray today is going to talk to us about quality control and process control, color management for textiles, and then dive really deep into ICC Max. So stay tuned. Make sure you listen to this podcast and make sure you follow us on LinkedIn. So Ray, to get started, uh, tell me about what's happening with X-Rite and some of the things that make life a little bit easier uh, to manage when we're talking about textiles, inkjet, uh, direct to fabric uh, solutions, and now they can color manage that with some pretty familiar color servers that we have in the print industry. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, textiles and process control. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. So first of all, we talked about ECG, right? And, and, and so one of the things we're seeing in large format stuff, which tends to also introduce into the textile side, is the textile world, not that long ago, for the most part, was really not about printing textiles or not about printing textiles digitally. But so much of the textile world has now moved to digital print, either for things like Billboards, right? Who thought billboards were going to be printed on textiles? But for all sorts of good reasons, that's true. You know, easier to ship, easier to set up, better for the environment. Great. Mm -hmm. But then we also have backlit signage that's being used in other places. And then we also have direct-to-garment printing, all these kind of things. This part of the printing world is exploding, right? And in the the old days, (laughs) in the old days, like my old days, um, you know, what would happen is we were happy to get bright, vibrant color onto the textile. That was a win. That's no longer a win. That's like, well, yeah, but it's not the right red. That's not the red I wanted in my fabric design. That doesn't represent my brand color. So, you know, that goes down to the same challenges we had in print years and years ago, right? We need to have control. So part of that is having the right targets to be able to to go in and, uh, you know, characterize a four, six, seven, eight color uh, wide format device or, you know, checking proofing versus that control. So, you know, one of the things I worked with uh, the print properties group is just having something as simple as a large format control wedge, primarily for textiles, but for the rest of the wide format world as well. Because we introduced a product, the i1 Pro 3 Plus, into this uh, last year. And I go, well, how do, you, how do you control this proof? Well, we don't have a standardized target for that. And then we don't, and it's like, so, whoa, you know, clearly yeah. there's some places here that as I became more educated in what was going on in that market, that it became clear that these guys have the same challenges we've had in other areas. And they were ripe for this to get tools that will really help them control their process. So, you know, ID Alliance created this large format uh, textile printing control wedge right at the right time, right? Right as the the whole industry was moving to needing that kind of control, there they were. So, Ray, you referenced the iPro 3 Plus and just to let our listeners know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have one of Ray's colleagues on, uh, Jay Kebley, to talk about the iPro 3 uh, Plus and its features and how that applies to textiles. So we'll go in, go in a little deeper uh, into the use of that device and quality uh, control or process control for uh, the iPro 3 and textiles. Very interesting conversation. 
Ray, I want to move on to communicating uh, print quality information throughout the supply chain. Brands are definitely in need of, uh, and they demand better communication of standards and specifications and things to make sure their products are, uh, you know, conforming to, to things like Grackle 2013 G7, uh, uh, their spot color tolerances. And in the packaging industry, uh, we talk to a lot of people from the brand side as well as from their print service providers. And they all say communication is a key in any way that we can automate that and make that foolproof human error proof. Uh, is a, a step in the right direction. So I'm going to talk to you about PQX. That's the uh, print quality exchange format that started out in the ID Alliance Print Properties and Color Metric Committee. You've been a, uh, an integral part of that, as well as a few others like... Um, I don't want to forget anybody, but Mark Levine. And uh, there's many people that have co uh, collaborated on this. Diane Kennedy was the chair. So talk to me about this uh, uh, specification and standard and the schema uh, print quality uh, exchange format that will help bridge the gap in communicating back and forth to uh, brands, print buyers, and well, the entire supply chain. One of the things that most of our standardized print spaces talk about, right, are CM1K. Right. Right. And yet when we talk about brands, we're often talking about special colors and, color, and, yeah. and things like that that are that are that are the brand. Right. So mm -hmm. so those those go beyond just have you hit Grackle. You know, you may be running Grackle for the images, but you're you're carrying uh, trade information, brand information on spot colors. And that for them, you know, that's like their name. So. Yeah, and this yeah, is I, an important aspect uh, as far as X right Pantone. I mean, it's uh, you live deeply in both worlds. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I, you know, Pantone is the name in in spot colors. I mean, there, you know, many people think of that as a synonymous kind of process, mm -hmm. and certainly from from brands we work with brands to have specific Pantone colors associated with brands, mm -hmm. but also it's it's the idea that. Um, this whole idea of carrying across a workflow is sort of integral to the, to, you know, our, our goal, right? Cause we start all the way up in the viewing area and then we, you know, work through with measuring and software solutions that go through every step of the process. And that's where we really saw this challenge. So, and so, so, you know, PQX is trying to answer that in a different way, right? It's, it's saying, okay. So let's say you've got solutions from, you know, different vendors. How can we move that quality information to whatever place there is? So it's, again, it's a communication uh, challenge to go do that. And, it, and PQX really requires at some level PRX as well. They're not, as standards, they're not built so one requires the other. But really, as I said before in a different piece, often to make a standard work, it requires looking at the workflow on other on either side of that standard as well. I see. And and PQX and PRX are sort of like that because PQX is the raw quality data. And that's what it is. And it's a great, well defined using CXFX slash X, you know, in the uh, for doing the measurement stuff and communicating the measurement data. So it's a well, you know, right. uh, laid out plan for that. But it has lots of other data in there as well. But the thing is, is that that's so that's the raw measurement data of that and the quality raw data, but it doesn't have the requirements part built into it. All right. So that's where PRX comes into. And while PQX is now done, it's an ISO standard. Thankfully, that's whatever you said, five years of work later. Um, and PRX is close to being done, but it's not quite done yet. So that's part of the puzzle is to get those two pieces as finalized standard, but then it's also to see how that works in the workflow. Like, I mean, so x ray has probably one of the, in, in color cert, probably one yeah. of the largest uh, print quality reporting systems out there. Right. And one of the challenges that we see from brands, right, is that they would love to have every printer participate. And so they want to do that, but the printer wants to know before they get there that they're submitting the quality that the brand wants. So the raw data isn't quite enough. So that's where, you know, knowing what the requirements are from PRX or some other process is important. But then also there's challenges in how that PQX data gets submitted, right? Because for many of our brands, 
you know, they want qualified printers submitting, which means that they have some information that is proprietary that they want encrypted. And then they have going into a server where they don't want to have any corruption of data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to do penetration testing, what they call in, in yeah, internet pen world testing. You know, yeah. pen testing and that kind of stuff. So, you know, all of this stuff are the, the starts to become the elements to create a system to go does do that. So just being able to write a PQX isn't going to be enough. Just like just being able to write, you know, a, a CXF file isn't enough. Right. Unless we know where the system wants to do it. But these are the elements that are going to bring us that system to have a better exchange across there. If you're, if you're working with, you know, different suppliers in different parts of the process. Gotcha. So, so this, you know, this is the cool thing, right? Is that these are the building blocks um, but any building block by itself is just still sort of an island. We got to work them together to make them make them happen. Yeah, and it's ultimately, you know, it it solves the automation. I want to say automation of transparency. I don't know if that's a new term or maybe we can make it a new term. <laughs> I think you coined one, Jeff. Dag on right. Um, <laughs> automation, like Internet of Things, we'll call it A O T, automation of transparency. So, Ray, the uh, next topic that uh, I want to discuss is uh, ISO Pass 15339. And these are the seven data sets that have been published that are based on G7 gray balance and tonality and uh, very, you know, common hue angles, uh, all things that are, you know, conditions, target conditions that are important. And um, the when we look at ISO uh, specifications and standards um, globally, a global use for them, um, we kind of get lost in the alphabet soup again of acronyms. And so we have an ISO standard and then we have what uh, I just mentioned, ISO pass 15339. So can you explain to our listeners uh, ISO pass and, and what, how is that defined? Yeah, so uh, in, in a sense, uh, a pass is a publicly available specification, all right? So this is something that, that ISO believes is important to get out there. But like I said before, you know, a standard, once we make a standard, we don't want to change it dramatically, right? And so mm -hmm. when we introduced CGATS 21, of which 15339 is the ISO derivative of that, this was kind of a new process. This is that learning process, right, where it was M1, and everything was, you know, near neutral or G7, right? So everything in there had this nice relationship from one process to the next for, you know, one quality of paper to the next quality of paper. So it ha so this was this reference print condition or a way to exchange, you know, data was a little bit of a new thing for the world. We've been doing this in, in the U.S. for a while and, and certainly, you know, through ID Alliance for a while. So we've done this process and getting it to the world, it was like a little scary, I'd say. Right. So there was there was concern. So we went down originally the idea of, of making it a standard and it met some resistance. And so by making it a publicly available specification, that makes the resistance less and lets it get out there to the, a broader audience than just a, a U.S. standard. Mm -hmm. And now that time is up, so to speak. Um, what happens with a publicly available specification, ISO says, OK, so we've had a chance to air it to the world. Now, either it's good enough to become an ISO, an, you know, international standard or an IS, or we should pull it out of there because it didn't meet industry's need. Yeah. Well, we can see. I mean, you look at the number of documents around the world that reference these printing conditions now right. as a way to test things, as a way of actually exchanging information and so forth, that, you know, two years from now, this thing times out. And so this is the time when we're going to start up and do the, the little dibs and dabs you've got to do to change from a, a PAS to an IS so that it can become uh, an ISO standard so that, you know, People outside of uh, that, the world who still need, again, to point to a standard or true standard will have the benefits of having uh, these reference print conditions as standard conditions. What are some of the objections that one might find if they were sitting in an ISO meeting determining and trying to make a decision collectively 
to make this a standard? Does it have to be used by 10 people? Does uh, a company with uh, all, you know, billions of dollars in the bank use it? You know, they use it all the time. It's, like, <laughs> it's case study. And it's, yeah, yeah. Google uses it. Microsoft uses it. So it must be good. Let's make it a standard. <laughs> if that's the case, if that's the case, it should be a standard. Yeah, well, I, I wish it were so simple, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but the reality is the you know, standards are made up of countries. Countries are who get the votes. Right. On. And so it requires a standard requires a pretty high bar, uh, you know, for the number of countries that vote positively for that standard. So, and so that's like 75 percent of the countries who are I part see. of that a particular technical committee need to vote positively. Where a PAS is about 50%. And I may have those numbers off a little bit because I'm not looking them up. But but the point is, right, the bar is different. And so when you bring something that's new, right, it's it's harder to get to that 75% agreement. It's new. And so, you know, think about what we said when we looked at 12647-2, the fact that we're bringing near neutral into there because the world is really requesting it. Yeah. So that was one of the challenges of 15339, right? Is it because it was G7, it was near neutral. And many people weren't there yet. The yeah. world has moved on, right? So now the fact that many people, many more people in the world are using G7 and many people have now recognized the value of these reference print conditions now make this process easier. But this is a question of you know, in a sense, socialization, right? It's a question of getting people to understand things that are a little bit abstract, maybe. So, you know, and that's yeah. the same thing that uh, the whole goal of this podcast is, is to say these standards aren't out of nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's socializing the use of these standards. Perfect. So moving right along, Ray, um, really interested in knowing as well uh, what is happening with ICC Max, this is a uh, level of improvement for the ICC specification. And uh, talk to us about ICC Max. What's the current state? Where are we at? And what do we got to look forward to in the future? Yeah, so we think about ICC color management in the form that we're using it primarily today. And it seems like it works well for most people. So why, yeah, why do we need another specification, right? But, but the answer is pretty straightforward because we've moved into some new worlds. You know, printing is no longer just the, the one area, but we've got printing on all sorts of different materials. We've got printing that's used in different places. And so there's a lot of different pieces that, that the current ICC didn't envision when it was built several of them that are near and dear to my heart, which, you know, we've had to work around as, as a makers of a IC pro, ICC profiling package. One is the current version of ICC is fixed D50 colorimetry. So, you know, right. our standard viewing graphic arts is D50, which is great. But if you need to have your colorimetry or your output matched for a particular place, D50 may not be the, sp the spot. Or if you're working in an industry where their their norm is D65, which is, oh, yeah, like almost every industry other than the graphic arts, right. that becomes a little bit more of a challenge. So ICC Max, one of the things that allows you to do is define any kind of colorimetry that you want to use. Got That's it. a huge step forward. Yeah. And right now, for us to do this inside our I1 profile, we sort of do some secret sauce halfway through the process to go uh, write this back in in forms of D50 kind of sort of, but it's it's a challenge. And then one of the things also is it says, hey, you can use spectral data because then if they have spectral data in that profile, there's all sorts of other things you can do. You can do this change in colorimetry, but you can do lots of other things. You can check on things like, you know, is this color going to look the same under three different light conditions, right? Metamorism. Exactly. Right. So, so it addresses metamorism really is what you're telling me. Yeah, it's exactly the case. But think about that in terms of, you know, I'm going to go print some textiles and I don't want this. I don't want my green socks to turn a different color than, you know, my pants that I'm also digitally printing. Then suddenly uh, this is something that I can deal with or predict both mm -hmm. potentially using, you know, different pieces of ICC Max. But I can't do that in any way in a current ICC oh, profile. Sad. So ICC Max is an ISO standard. Um, as I usually say when I talk about standards, none of the standards stand alone, right? In this case, it's not so much that the standard needs other standards around side of it, 
but it needs other workflow tools around there. So if, if I want to use uh, ICC Max profile and I want to use it, I want to build it in XYZ tool and then go use it in my RIP for my uh, wide format printer. It means that that wide format printer needs to accept the use of an ICC Max profile. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's early days for this process. I mean, I yeah. think that the, on the original ICC uh, profiles, and then when we moved to ICC version four, how long it took some of the commercially standard tools, if you will, I mean, you know, very popular commercial tools to get up to speed of proper implementation of ICC version four, and that's the kind of thing we're seeing with ICC Max right now. So the best implementations we see of ICC Max now are essentially in closed worlds. I see. You know, if I yeah. if I want to use ICC Max and some of the power of ICC Max in a in a display profiling package, so I can do some cool things with that, I can do that because it exists in its own world. If I want to do that inside my own RIP, I can potentially do that in my own RIP, and I can get some valuable stuff out of that. But we're not seeing yet that that acceptance across you know from the different workflow tools and one of the reasons why is the fact that icc max is huge and it was never meant to be used as one big thing it was really designed to to create a, a very open specification that's using you know cxf is measurement data and spectral data and things like that but you know it has the tools inside there to use a certain portion of icc Max to do things like very small profiles using algorithms instead of lots of measurement data. Right. Or, you know, maybe what it want, maybe what you want to do is do something that requires something else and and but you want to make sure that it will work in this workflow in the future. So the concept in ICC Max to make that all work is something that is a mouthful. And, <laughs> it's something called an interoperability conformance specification. <laughs> um, and while it's a mouthful, what it really says is, we'll take this little piece, this little ICS, right? And that will define the use for something. Ray, let me paint a scenario or a possible use case uh, that ICC Max may solve or may not solve, and that's color alignment across different uh, materials. So let's take a, uh, uh, a a campaign, merchandising campaign, where we have a couple players. Let's say we have a tennis shoe manufacturer, a sports apparel manufacturer, and uh, gaming and a sports team. Okay, so that ad campaign and uh, everything that goes into it, we have cross media or social media marketing or cross platform marketing, whatever you want to call it. And then we, of course, we have uh, images going out uh, for signs and displays. We have images on TV, uh, commercials. Uh, then we have the game itself and uh, we're looking at the color through the monitor. And then we have the tennis shoes and then the sports apparel. And then of course the brand identity guidelines for that let's say it's the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. Okay. But we want all of that to come together and look similar. Does ICC max help solve that, solve that scenario? I follow you and, and you've really gone perhaps even further, right? I mean, that's the beauty and the problem in ICC max. Like you said, Oh, I want to know how this tennis shoe looks that it's, it looks right in this rendered condition, really, right? Because you're talking about putting it into a video game or something. And that's a different, you know, that requires different stuff in ICC Max and potentially some other uh, things too. But, but you know, that requires a different set of tools. Maybe, you know, you need to measure that with a multi-angle device because you've got not just, you've got multiple different kinds of fabrics and mm -hmm. reflective things and things like that. So you need all that. Well, guess what? An ICC Max profile can accept multi-angle information and do very cool things with it. But, you know, you said, what, how, how will it help me today? And the answer is right now, it helps you in discrete tools. It helps you in a display piece or it helps you in your rip. And the next step, using these ICSs is to get that interoperability between the different systems. Gotcha. I mean, one of the small steps that we've taken 
at Xrite is, you know, we write a version of ICC Max stuff in, we make it an option into some profiles that takes some things that we've had in proprietary parts of the ICC profile, so like spectral data, yeah. things like that, and move it in to the public places for ICC Max profiles. I see. So that if you're going to take this profile, you, t- you, know, you need to take this into an ICC Max workflow, then the data is there, right? So that's a very small step down this road, but that's the kind of process that we need to start with. And the next step is, you know, getting these, these ICSs into a place so that we can all use them. And some of the the bigger players in the market maybe can then embrace them more wholeheartedly than they have so far. But the beauty of ICC Max is exactly where you were headed, though, right, is I've got a, a set of requirements that I say take my brand from a video game to point of display to printed product to, you know, something else. Maybe social media, a uh, video, right. or yeah, you know, or, or, yeah. Let's look at a something. big one right now, right? So let's look at HDR displays. HDR is you know you walk into your local big box store and you're getting hit with all these high definition uh, TV sets and mm-hmm. and so forth. Well, the current kind of uh, architecture for ICC is is got some challenges when you get to these kind of conditions, which are you know have some very unique properties when we look at these very large gamut, very high right. uh, brightness displays, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a case where IC Max could help solve some of those as well, right? We can solve some of them using traditional IC methods, but IC Max has some things that would allow us to do more better, as I like to say. More better. And so, and so we're going to see that stuff, but, you know, we're in early days yet. And this is, and this is where... It's interesting because it doesn't seem like early days. I've been working on ICC Max for a while now, and uh, our team and the whole ICC has been working on this. But I just try and use that uh, rearview mirror and look at how long it's taken you know, each of the steps of ICC to get that industry-wide adoption and how far, once the adoption has happened, how fast it suddenly moved the industry forward, right? And so that's the same process here. As I see Max is building momentum. A lot of people want to know about it. It's not quite in the toolbox for everybody. It's starting to be in the toolbox for some people. And we get the level of adoption we have now or three times, and suddenly it's just going to be, poof, it's going to you know take off and allow the industry to do some very cool things that right now are very challenging for the industry to do. And what parts of the industry in the print uh, and packaging side of the house has ICC Max really gained traction? Uh, and the two that are they're most likely, you're most likely to see it right now today are going to be in uh, display and in a few um, rips, largely the rips being ones that have to deal with uh, non paper or substrates, you know, so in the wide format area and things like that, though, you're going to see it there because it, it solves immediate problems for them right away. The next place you'll see it, I think, is when we even in any kind of process is we're going to see potentially the ability to do this for um, what I call and I don't think that's what IC Max calls it, but but uh, algorithmic profiles, right? Building profiles out of very small uh, data sense. sets and yeah. iterating those profiles with with a minimum of information. Nice. And that's useful in pretty much any kind of print condition. Absolutely. So. It uh, definitely would make a difference as far as uh, time to uh, align uh, a device to whatever the target condition that's required because of uh, having the wave respect photometers, even if I had an offline and I could, uh, let's say, cut the uh, pad size in half with an offline device, I mean, that's going to be much more efficient. And uh, we all want better and more accurate profiles without uh, 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 a large amount of labor. But, you know, in some ways, the most exciting stuff for me are things like, you know, understanding um, right now when we look at at print on paper and we see a a proof, Mm -hmm. but we see it electronically, we lose a lot of the characteristics of the paper. Right. Right. So we don't understand what the impact of the gloss or the slight texture of that paper is or that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And most of the the ways that it's rendered right now are not really direct information of that actual surface characteristics. They're they're just saying, you know, it's Uh canvas or it's whatever, but it's generic. Right. This is one of the areas where I think from a 
from an upstream process as we look about design, mm -hmm. if you could encode in that profile things about the material specification. So if I specify that I want to make this shoe out of this kind of material, or I want to print this onto uh, a deluxe canvas and understand how that's going to interact with the light in the, the environment yeah. that I'm going to go in. That's huge stuff. And that stuff is all doable. So Ray, fantastic. And thank you so much for taking these very technical topics and making them easy to understand. Uh, I personally got a tremendous amount out of this discussion and the uh, one that we did previously. And thank you for taking the time to uh, share that with us today. If you need any more information on uh, some of the subjects that we've covered, you can always visit ID Alliance at idealliance.org or follow us on LinkedIn. And of course, x uh, a plethora of information up there on some of these subjects or even color.org is another reference uh, that is uh, very, very valuable, uh, especially when we're talking about ICC Max. So Ray, again, thank you and take care. Thanks for listening to the Gamut Podcast. If you have ideas, suggestions, or would like to join us or even sponsor future podcasts, simply email me at jcollins at idealliance.org. That's J-C-O-L-L-I-N-S at idealliance.org. Take care and have a productive day. 